Uh, we're going to continue in our series, Unless the Lord Builds a House. Um, and um, <clears throat> a couple of weeks ago, when we got together, we talked about uh, Psalm 127, verse 1. Uh, and it basically says, Lord, Unless the Lord builds a house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. And, and the, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about that first portion of the verse, unless the Lord builds a house, those who build it labor in vain. Uh, basically, <clears throat> we feel that in the life of a church, we feel that this is a time to build, but not a time to build in conventional ways. We often think of, of uh, building the church numerically. We're actually thinking of being uh, careful in how we build versus how much we, uh, uh, you know, sort of take in as a result of building, right? Uh, I mentioned that we need to go back to foundational principles of God's word. Uh, we foundational principles of prayer and worship and just authentic fellowship in the body of Christ, in the body of believers as we all are. We talked about and established that the Bible is the builder's code. How many of you know that you need a builder's code to build a house. If not, you end up doing what I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, if you remember that illustration, that man that uh, built the house by himself. He had the blueprints, he gave it to a builder, and he said, go ahead and build. And he built it according to the blueprints that, that the man had created. Well, he built a beautiful first floor, a beautiful second floor, but the man neglected to actually put a staircase to go to the second floor. And that's, that can happen if we trust in our own strength and we trust in our own abilities. Many times we make a mess out of things. We don't realize what we need to do. And so he, uh, we need to build the house according to the builder's code, which is the word of God, so that when the structure is erected, it will stand the storms of life and, and, and will stand the test of time. Uh, I mentioned that plans, designs, and strategies will avail to very little if God is not directing those plans, those strategies. They will avail to little. We'll waste our time. We'll spend our effort trying to construct, to build, to do something that God is not in. When God is in something, that's what results as a blessing. And in Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 9, it says that the heart of man plans his ways, but the Lord establishes his steps. The heart of man plans his ways, but the Lord establishes his steps. And so we talked about this divine tension that exists in this psalm, that tension that talks about uh, the, unless the Lord builds a house, the laborers build in vain. There's a, a distinct uh, and unique connection between building the house and the laborers, that God builds, but the laborers participate. And so as much as God is doing the building, we also need to get into the building as well. We are laborers in the field, and there's this divine tension of relying and confidence in God, but also taking action. When do we take action? When do we step into the action? When do we actually do the building? There's that tension. There's a tension defined between faith and resting in God. Faith to advance and do something, but also resting in the Lord and knowing when he wants us to step and do what he wants us to do. We talked about the fact that that word, unless, is that a conditional truth. Unless the Lord builds the house. Unless basically means that if God doesn't build it, it will not matter. It won't matter. Moses said in Exodus 33 verse 15, he said, if your presence will not go with me, do not bring us from here. And if God's presence is not going to be with us, we are going to just stay put and stay quiet and wait for the Lord to act. Because God's presence is catalyst for everything we do, everything we do, unless negates all other sources of success because it's the Lord or nothing. And then finally, we talked about the fact that success is dependent on both God and us. It's not just the Lord. Unless the Lord builds a house, the laborers build in vain. There is a connection between one and the other. 
Church, we said, is not a place that we go to. It's a family we belong to. Church is not just a place we come to. It's a family that we belong to. Church is not just a a location that we drive to. It is an assignment that we have from God. It's an assignment to be together, to have authentic fellowship, to seek the Lord in spirit and in truth. That is just so critical, church, that we understand that. Just like an investor that invests in a company, that has stakes in a company, would not uh, uh, pay any attention or zero attention to what is happening. He just gets involved. He's invested. That's why they're called investors. He's invested in that business. He wants to know what's happening. He wants to understand what type of work is being done, what progress is being made. And that way, he, uh, you know, that progress will actually guarantee success. The same way is for us as a church. That as the Lord builds and we participate in that building with him, that we actually are investing in the kingdom of God together. And so today we're going to talk about the second part of Psalm 127. And and I mentioned last time that this is a song, a song of Solomon. He wrote the psalm because he understood everything about building, didn't he? Uh, Solomon was the man that built the greatest structure on planet Earth, the temple, the, probably the greatest church building that's ever been built. I know that some of them are fancy, and I don't know, I don't think he had coffee machines in there, but I'll tell you one thing that temple was beautiful. And people will come from far and near to look at the temple of the Lord that had been erected for the glory of God. And in fact, the Bible tells us that when the temple was dedicated, that the Shekinah glory of the Lord, was like a cloud, came into the midst of the people. And you know what the priests did? They fell down on the ground and they did nothing. They did nothing. They could not minister because God's presence was greater than their agendas and plans and ideas and dedication. And I so wish in my heart that the presence of God would just so come I mean, Lord, if you come, every Sunday we get together and we experience the glory of God in this place. And I don't ever have to preach or anybody else. You know, that's good for me. If God's presence is here, it will make all the difference in the world. We have gotten church so miscued, I think, in our understanding of what church should really truly be like. We depend on a sermon. We depend on the singers. But you know what? God is building us on the inside. He wants us to come in as worshipers. He wants us to come in as people that have been in the word. So that we just don't depend on a man up here. We don't depend on a band to lead us. We will have come already with the presence of God in our hearts. And the truth of God's word on our lips. That is what church should really truly be like. I believe that with all my heart, with all my heart. In Psalm 127, King Solomon was basically giving us a warning. And the warning was this, build carefully. Build carefully. Build with the Lord. And if you build with the Lord, you will build well. Why was he giving us a warning? Because he understood that, you see, Solomon started well, but he finished badly. And we need to start well and finish well. And the only way that we can finish well is if we truly place our trust in the Lord. Solomon kind of fell away. And that resulted in the disunity and the, the separation of God's people scattered and then taken into captivity, the destruction of the walls, the disarray of the temple of God. Yeah. Scholars agree that this psalm was a song that was actually sung during the times of Nehemiah when Nehemiah rebuilt the temple. Now, Nehemiah was a cupbearer to the king. Yeah. In other words, he was a wine steward. 
He knew what I can only imagine. Hello, King. You know, I'm bringing you a 1924 bottle of Sauvignon Rouge. <laughs> I know, I speak French, in case you didn't realize it. And you know what? I don't know what exactly he did. Maybe he was one of those guys that had to taste the wine before the king actually drank it in case it was poison because everybody wanted to kill the king at that time and, and just, you know, take over. But I know that uh, Nehemiah was a cupbearer. He was not a builder. Guys, he had no idea what he was doing. None. Cupbearer to be becoming a builder. How many of you know what building takes? <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. How do you do it? A wine expert to become a builder? I don't know. He was a construction guy all of a sudden. But we know one thing about Nehemiah. He was a devout believer. He clearly had a mandate from God to do something bigger than himself. He rebuilt the walls. Now, Nehemiah, guys, was, built, was born in captivity. He had no idea what had happened to the people, but he knew that something had taken place that alienated the people of God. And so he understood, I need to do something about it. He became in himself, he basically assumed the guilt of the people of Israel. And he stood in proxy before them in chapter 1 and he, of Nehemiah. And he, he was just saying, Lord, forgive me for the sins of my fathers. Jesus. He understood that he needed to do something. Certainly, he was not the most qualified guy for the job. But one thing about Nehemiah was important. He was willing. He was willing. You see, God doesn't always use the most talented people on earth the most gifted individuals. In fact, he empowers those who are willing to do something for him. Right. Right. He will come and give us the power that we need in order to accomplish the tasks that he's assigning to us. That is what God does. What God does, he doesn't call the qualified, he qualifies the called. Right. That is something that we've gotten completely upside down because we look for the most qualified people the people that have the best way of speaking the people that can just impress you with the way they get dressed and and all the paraphernalia but you know what god god qualifies those whom he calls and that is what i believe in my heart that god wants to take each and every one of us and place a calling on our lives and say hey go forth in my name and accomplish the things that I am telling you to accomplish. Because God, God qualifies the called. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Be on the alert. Walls around the city in ancient times were used to protect the city and its people. And so when the walls will be torn down, that meant open exposure to potential attacks from any enemy, whether that be human enemy or actual animal, right? I mean, you probably open up your door. In Florida, you open up your door and you see alligators. Maybe in Jerusalem during that time, you open up a door and you see a lion in front of you. Not a good thing. So you want to have walls and you want to have gates. And the city of Jerusalem was in ruin. In 1 Peter chapter 5, in verse 8, it says these words, Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. The enemy's goal is, and plan is basically to look for believers whose walls are down. Just like the walls of Jerusalem were down. And people were open to attacks. The enemy is looking for people whose walls are down. Whose defenses are down. He is looking for prayerless churches. He is looking for churches that are heavy with programs. With no prayer gatherings. 
no power to display what the Holy Spirit wants to do. He's looking for churches where the Holy Spirit is relegated to some kind of a backroom experience for weird people. But that is not what we ought to do as believers. I don't know, why am I yelling? I'm yelling today, I don't know why. Maybe I'm just a little convicted about this. I want to see God move in our midst. I do with all my heart. I don't really care about any program. And you know what? That has been the trap of the North American church. We're so laden with programs. Do this. Do that. Do the other. Run here. Run there. Run from her. You know what? And we've forgotten the simplicity of the gospel to go and preach the gospel to people that don't know Jesus. We've gotten away from sharing our faith with those who don't know him. And so the walls come down and the enemy comes in. And he takes over. Guys, we've got to stay on the alert. And we need to start with the understanding that places us one step ahead of what the enemy wants to do. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 11, Paul said these words. So that we would not be outwitted by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his schemes. We should not be outwitted by the devil. We're not ignorant of his schemes. Now, let me take it to the, step, to the verse before and give you context. In the context of this verse, and this is talking about an individual who has sinned and caused others hurt and pain. We've all experienced that. We've all gone through situations that have caused hurt and pain. And so what Paul is saying here, forgive so that Satan will not have one up on you. Forgive so that Satan will not be outwitting you. But you will outwit the devil if you understand his plans and purposes. We need to be aware and be alert and open to the working of the Holy Spirit in each and every one of us to convict us into those areas that we have allowed the enemy to come in and take over. Because you know what? Perhaps out of ignorance, because out of no, not knowing what we should say or do. But I tell you today, God wants to make us aware. He wants to make us, cause us to be awakened and be on the alert. We need to be on the alert so that he cannot sneak in through cracks and openings on our walls. You know, the enemy is compared to a snake. And he is very, snakes are incredible. Because they can squeeze in through the smallest of cracks. And hide. And then pounce on the prey. That's what the enemy does. Church, we have got to stay intentional in our relationship with God. We have got to make those things that I mentioned before that are foundational to our belief system, prayer, worship, the word, the blood of Jesus. Those are our foundations. That is what creates a wall of protection around us. You know, just like my iPad or your laptop or your phone, you know, we don't realize it. Those devices are protected. We have on your computer, hopefully you have an antivirus and you have a firewall. If you don't and you can't get to some things, that might be the reason. But you know, when there's a firewall and there is an antivirus protection, when viruses are sent or Trojan horses are sent, those are like attached to your computer, right? The machine will stop it. That wall of protection will hinder those outside elements from coming in and affecting, infecting your computer. That is the same for us. If we build our lives around what the word of God says, the enemy will try to come, but he's not going to stay there because yeah. it'll bounce right out. Yes. In Psalm 127, <clears throat> in verse 1, we read... <clears throat> That unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. Unless, unless that negates 
any other source but the Lord, unless it's the Lord or nothing, unless, unless, unless. The psalmist was basically saying that you can install a CPI alarm system in your house. You can set up the loudest and strongest sirens on the outside and inside to fend off the enemy that may want to come and steal. But you know what? Unless the Lord is watching over us, we're open to a sneaky and strategic devil that does not want to lose ground. So number one, we need to stay alert. Number two, in this verse, we need to understand who is protecting us. It says, unless who? Unless the Lord builds the house. Unless the Lord, unless the Lord watches. Unless the Lord watches. The Lord is in, in this particular verse is Yahweh, is Jehovah, is the eternal God. You know what? Jewish people were not even allowed to write the full name of God. You know, we say Jehovah. They actually only used the consonants. They were not allowed to put in the vowels in the name because that was disrespectful to God. That was a holy name. This is the Lord. This is Jehovah, the self-existing God, the eternal God. He is powerful. He is mighty. There's nothing that the Lord cannot do. There's absolutely nothing, nothing that he cannot accomplish. Nothing escapes his attention. I want you to know that God sees everything that happens around your life. He hears every word that you speak. He hears every word that people speak against you. He understands, he sees, he knows. He knows. He watches over us. He watches over us. All of our conversations, all of our heart cries before God, He hears every word. He misses nothing. And unless we trust in God to watch over our lives and our families, we will be open prey to the devil who knows how to hunt. He knows how to hunt. He looks for open cracks in a wall. He looks for open opportunities to come in. He misses nothing. And you know what? God is more acute and intense. And he also also misses nothing. And unless we trust in him to watch over our lives, over our families, over everything, our businesses, our you know, all of our involved areas of our lives. We may waste our time if we take on the responsibility on ourselves. And we say, i got to watch my stuff. You can't watch your stuff, guys. It's just not going to happen. We need the Lord to do it. That's the Lord. But in this verse, point number three, it's the Lord is watching. It says, unless the Lord watches. And in the original uh, Hebrew, This particular word, watch, means to keep guard, to keep watch, to ward off, to protect, and to save a life. That is what God can do. That's a very active verb. This is not a God, kind of like a uh, a lifeguard, sitting around waiting for, you know, children to do something illegal, blowing his whistle, saying, get off the pool, you, you... You should not do that. Or when it's time for the adult swimming, you know, he'll blow the whistle. And now that's that's not what God is doing here. God is actually active in the way that he's watching over his children. God cares for us. We are his sons and daughters. And our protection is his business. He watches over us because he loves us so much. He is watching over us as individual parents, as individual men and women. He's watching over our children. He is watching over all of us. Listen to what Psalm uh, 121 says. Behold, he who keeps Israel will never slumber or sleep. Maybe I didn't put that verse up there. I did not. Psalm 121 says, behold, he who keeps Israel will never slumber or sleep. Never. Now, listen to this. Nehemiah was commissioned by God to build the walls. Those walls had been down for years, but he managed to build them. How many of you know in how many days? 
52 days. 52 days. How in the world do you do it? You're not even a builder. How does that even happen? 52 days. For years, they had tried and did not accomplish the task. We know that they had constant opposition. Tobiah and Sambalat, they were like the devil, relentless, accusing, pushing. They had to encourage one another to keep going and finish the work. And these were just regular people, regular Joes like you and I. That, and their purpose was to defend their families. The Bible says that they did something very unique. If you bring it up, Nehemiah 4 and 16 says, From that day on, half of the men did their work, while the other half were equipped with spears, shields, bows, and armor. The officers posted themselves behind all the people of Judah who were building the walls. Those who had carried material did their work with one hand and held a weapon in the other. And each of the builders wore a sword at his side as he worked. But the man who sounded the trumpet stayed with them. I can, I can just see it, you know, I'm like, you know, they're going to build a wall. Sometimes you need a pick to build a wall. But while they're building, they got their sword. Yes, I do own a Rambo knife. In case you were wondering, it's, it's tied, it's secure, don't worry about it. They're like, you know what? Let's bust these walls, that are the, the, the stones that are broken so we can rebuild. And so they're going at it. And they're like, you know what? We're rebuilding, but, you know, in case the enemy comes, he's going to get a piece of this. Amen. We're not taking it. We're not just going to let the enemy come in and take it from us. That's what they were doing. They were aware that the enemy wanted to come in. You know what? What is the sword of the spirit? It's the word of God. We have everything we need. Everything we need to defend ourselves against the wiles of the enemy. There comes a time when we work and we fight. When we put our hands to the plow and we fend off the enemy with our weapon, the word of the spirit, the word of God, the sword of the spirit, sorry, the word of God. And we be aware that there's an enemy that comes, that can come. And when we are aware, we will do what we can to defend ourselves. Finally, let me just mention that the Lord is the Lord of a kingdom of opposites. The way that God works is not the way that we work. The way God strategizes is not the way we strategize. I think we all understand that God's way is not our way. Right. In fact, in Isaiah chapter 55 and verse 8 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declare the Lord. In other words, what you think is not what I think. And the way that you want to go is not the way that I want to go. You may choose the left turn I sometimes choose the right turn and you're thinking to stay and I'm thinking go you're thinking go and I'm thinking stay because God's way many times is opposite to our thinking <clears throat> often we need to ask ourselves what is it that my natural mind wants to do whatever your natural mind wants to do do the contrary do the contrary I'll save you some aggravation but let me give you some <clears throat> illustrations of that Second Chronicles 20, 20. You'll never forget that. 2020, <laughs> this year. And also 2020, right? To, to verse 22, it says this. And they rose early in the morning, and they went out in the wilderness of Tekoa. No, that is not in Arizona or Colorado, just in case you were wondering. And when they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God and you will be established. Believe his prophets and you will succeed. And when he had taken counsel with the people, he appointed those who were to sing to the Lord and praise him in his holy attire. As they went before the army and say, Give thanks to the Lord, for his steadfast love endures forever. 
And when they began to sing, check this out, and praise the Lord, set an ambush against the, en the men of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, who had come against Judah so that they were routed. Wow. You think that that's a, a war strategy right there? Is anybody in the military? I know some of you have been. Some of you. Kyle, is that a good strategy for war? I don't think so. Uh, not so much, right? Oh, you know what? We're just going to go attack. We, 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 you know, we're involved in a war. Let's just send the singers ahead. <laughs> uh, what? What, Lord? Say that again. The singers? Yeah. <clears throat> send the singers. And let them sing. What? Yeah, can you imagine, like, going to battle? And the Lord is good, and his mercy, and the enemy is there, and doers for it. Boom, they're like falling. Boom, boom. And the Lord is good. Boom, boom. They're like falling left and right. What is going on? God, God <laughs> is creating victory out of nothing. Because God is God, and his ways are not our ways, and his methods are not ours. Wow. In Joshua chapter 6, verses 1 to 27, I'm not going to read that, but it's the account of the walls, of the fall of the walls of Jericho. We all understand and know we've read this passage so many times, heard it preached probably more times than we wish that we would hear it. But basically, the people of Israel were commissioned by God to do two things. One, march around the city once every day for six days. That's kind of terrifying. Like hundreds of thousands of people. I don't know how many. I think that they came out of Egypt with over a million. Just marching. Can you imagine like having a million people marching around your city and not saying a word? It's like, what is going on here? What is happening here? Like they're like freaking me out a little bit. They're like all watching through. You know, on top of the wall, looking like, what are they doing? Like, what are they doing? Are oh, they just walking? Oh, okay. And they did that for six days. And then on the seventh day, God messed up the strategy a little bit. And so he told them to do the opposite. Still walk around. But on the seventh day, they like, you know what? As you're walking around, start yelling and screaming. Hallelujah. Woo! Praise you, Jesus. And they're like blowing the horn. You now they're just going to war in the spirit, not in the natural. They had these thick walls. They were going to war in the spirit. They did not probably even understand what they were doing. But God knew what they were doing. God understood what, what, what they were doing. And so the seventh time, or the seventh day, walking around, and singing, shouting, and praising, and blowing the shofar, blowing the trumpet, the walls come tumbling down. Now, I don't know about you. I think that is the worst human battle strategy of all times. But you know what? I think it's also the best spiritual strategy of all times. It's the worst human one, but it's the best spiritual one. The walls did fall. Finally, one more example of this kingdom of opposites. Judges 7, 19 to 22 says, And so Gideon and the hundred men who were with him came out to the outskirts of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch, when they had just set the watch. And they blew the trumpets and smashed the jars that were in their hands. When the three companies blew the trumpets and broke the jars they held in their hands, the torches uh, and the torches and in their right hand, the trumpet blow. And when they cried and they cried out and saying a sword for the Lord and for Gideon and every man stood in place around the camp and all the army ran. They cried out and fled. And when they blew the 300 trumpets, remember that they started with, I can't remember the number now, 12,000 or 10,000 Man, and then they were reduced to 300 by God because that's all he thought that they would need. This was a great army, huge. But God said, you know what? You need only 300 men. 
The Lord set every man's sword against his comrade and against all the army, and the army fled. Now, that is another weird battle strategy, isn't it? You got a torch in your hand, you got a jar of water, you smash the jar, blow the horn, and all of a sudden, they're like killing each other. <laughs> that is not a battle strategy that you would ever adopt in the natural. But God knows what he is doing. Let me close by saying this, that work done apart from the Lord and his Holy Spirit is done in vain. The laborers build in vain. The watchers watch in vain. That word vain in the original means nothingness, emptiness, worthlessness. How do you desire to build? What's your desire as you want to build? We need to go back to the purposes of Psalm 127, the Psalm of Solomon. It was a warning to us to build well, to build carefully, to build with intentionality, to build with integrity. Building with the Lord often means doing the opposite, as I mentioned earlier. Yeah, yeah. Building with the Lord means setting aside human expertise and following God's expertise because he's a master plan and a master builder. My prayer is that we embark in this adventure where we realize that our battle is not ours, but it's the Lord. And our battle is never fought with rational methods of building. We are not going to build a natural way of thinking building. We build as we embrace that this is an upside down kingdom. And as we trust in the Lord to give us the victory, he will come. He will show up. He will bless his church. And my prayer is that